The Florida Historical Society presents Florida Frontiers is made possible in part by the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund and by Florida's Space Coast Office of Tourism, representing destinations from Titusville to Cocoa Beach to Melbourne Beach. The Space Coast has a diverse 72 miles of beach, including surf towns and sea turtle nests. We have inspiring attractions, including the Kennedy Space Center, Brevard Museum of History and Natural Science, and the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. More information is available at www.visitspacecoast.com. Florida history and culture from the Ice Age to the Space Age is on display at the Brevard Museum of History and Natural Science, located at 2201 Michigan Avenue in Cocoa. The museum has nature trails through 20 acres of three Florida ecosystems. The People of Windover exhibition features information about Florida's prehistoric past and actual artifacts used between 7,000 and 8,000 years ago. More information at brevardmuseum.org. Welcome to Florida Frontiers, presented by the Florida Historical Society. I'm Ben Broatmarkle. Coming up on the program, we'll be looking at the intersection of Florida nature and Florida culture. To do that, we'll go to Bach Tower Gardens in Lake Wales, the Atlantic Center for the Arts in New Smyrna, and Murakami Museum and Japanese Gardens in Delray Beach. Let's begin, though, at Vizcaya Museum and Gardens in Miami. Just blocks from the bustling urban setting of downtown Miami is an oasis of classical beauty in a serene and idealized natural setting. Known today as Vizcaya Museum and Gardens, the 40-room mansion surrounded by acres of meticulously landscaped gardens was originally the home of industrialist James Deering. As early as the 1890s, the Deering family started wintering in St. Augustine. James Deering's parents later moved to Coconut Grove, which would become part of Miami. James Deering was what's known as an agricultural industrialist. Um, his firm created agricultural farming equipment across the United States. It, uh, it became one of the largest um, manufacturing firms in the entire world. He was vice president of the firm, International Harvester. In 1908, at the age of 49, Deering retired from the International Harvester Company and initiated plans to create a palatial estate called Vizcaya. Deering's Gilded Age display of incredible wealth in Florida would rival the San Simeon Castle built by William Randolph Hearst in California. It's really unique. It's Italian inspired mainly on the exterior of the home, but if uh, when you're on the interior, especially the central courtyard that has Spanish influence or what we'd call Mediterranean influence. Um, and the house itself is really an ad adaptation of European traditions brought to this subtropical climate. So it's not a copy, it's not a pastiche, it's this really sort of unique um, integration of art, artifacts and architecture across hundreds of years um, to create this, this incredibly unique property. Construction on Vizcaya began in the fall of 1913 and Deering moved into the home on Christmas Day 1916. Deering wanted all of the latest technology available incorporated into the home, including a telephone, but he had architect F. Burl Hoffman create a structure that appeared to be about 400 years old. It would take until 1921 to complete the fantastic Vizcaya Gardens. The gardens were designed by Diego Suarez. He was a landscape architect who worked on the project along with uh, Paul Chalfin, who was the chief designer of the overall project and closely with Deering. Um, Diego Suarez was Colombian born but Italian trained landscape architect. So the, the gardens themselves are deeply influenced by um, Italian estate gardens um, ranging from the 1600s through the 1800s. The elaborate gardens of Vizcaya express the classical ideals of balance, symmetry, and rational design. The meticulously manicured shrubbery, trees, plants, and flowers are augmented by man-made structures intended to add to the beauty of the natural surroundings. 
Throughout the gardens are a series of follies. These are sort of unexpected moments. They could be sculptural, they could be a fountain piece, but they typically service as endpoints or transition points within the garden. So the gardens were designed as, uh, essentially as outdoor spaces or rooms. The biggest and most unique folly at Vizcaya is a piece of fantasy architecture sitting in the water in front of the mansion. The barge is a concrete representation of a ship designed to greet visitors arriving to the estate by boat from Biscayne Bay. Deering envisioned what would seem to be the back of his home as the front entrance facing the water. The barge was originally adorned with shrubbery and fountains and had a small summer home on board. Today, the structure is the least well-preserved aspect of the estate. Deering's grand attempt to control nature was challenged by nature itself on multiple occasions. A hurricane in 1926 and two in 1935 severely damaged the estate, leading to extensive repairs of the gardens. In 1992, Hurricane Andrew impacted the property, particularly the barge. In 2005, Hurricanes Katrina and Wilma further damaged the barge and caused water intrusion into the home. Deering did not live to see the destruction to his carefully designed estate. He was here less than 10 years. He passed away during um, a cruise on his way back from Paris to New York in 1925, which was unfortunate. Um, but he did enjoy his winters here, starting from, say, 1916 through 1925. In 1951, Deering's nieces, who were his heirs, sold the Vizcaya estate to Dade County and donated the interior furnishings of the house. The property opened as a museum the following year. Modern visitors to Vizcaya can be amazed by the excessive splendor of America's Gilded Age in Florida and contemplate the illusion of control over our natural environment. If sea levels were to rise to the point where the coastline of Florida was submerged, our peninsular state would become a series of islands. At the heart of one of those islands, a neo-Gothic tower of coquina and marble would rise 205 feet into the sky. Bach Tower Gardens near Lake Wales is one of the highest points in the state, 298 feet above sea level. President Calvin Coolidge presided over the dedication of the Singing Tower and its adjacent bird sanctuary on February 1, 1929. The facility was conceived and built by Edward Bach as a gift to the American people for the opportunities he had been given. Bach was born in 1863 in Donshelder, Netherlands. He immigrated to the United States with his family in 1870. He grew from a boy who didn't speak English to become a confidant of American presidents and a friend to literary figures such as Mark Twain and Rudyard Kipling. He made a fortune in publishing. Edward Bach came to this country from the Netherlands when he was just six years old, uh, immigrated with his family up to the uh, Pennsylvania area. And um, he loved to write and uh, eventually became a publisher. You know, started uh, in the publishing industry, worked his way in from the ground up. Uh, at 26 years old, he became the editor-in-chief of the Ladies' Home Journal magazine, uh, which was the first magazine in the world to have over a million subscribers. Um, so over the course of his life, he was interested in, in, in writing and in architecture and in beauty. And at a very young age, his grandmother told him to make you the world a bit better or more beautiful because you've lived in it. Bach would come from Pennsylvania to spend his winters near Lake Wales. He enjoyed watching sunsets from Iron Mountain and decided to stop plans to build a housing development there by purchasing the land. He hired landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. to transform a sand hill into a lush and thriving garden sanctuary. Olmsted worked with his father who designed New York's Central Park. He landscaped many of the most prominent landmarks in Washington, D.C., and served as the first director of the National Park Service. It took Olmsted six years to create the Bach Tower Gardens, bringing in rich soil, developing an elaborate irrigation system, and planting acres of carefully selected trees, plants, and flowers. The pathways through the garden all led to the Singing Tower. The idea was to uh, slowly reveal things to guests as they walk through the gardens. Uh, so the gardens back then, when they were first uh, dedicated 
uh, and completed were much smaller than they are today. Um, the original entrance was in a different place. Uh, but the pathways were all specifically meant to be meandering and you would slowly go around corners uh, in anticipation of what you would see next. All the while you might catch a glimpse of the tower and then it would disappear behind some oaks or behind some other, uh, other types of trees. When the tower comes into view, it is a spectacular sight. The tower is a combination of Gothic and Art Deco influences made of coquina stone from St. Augustine and pink and gray marble from Georgia. It was designed by architect Milton B. Maderi, who also created the Washington Memorial Chapel at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, and the Justice Department building in Washington, D.C. Carved into the tower is a unique combination of sacred, secular, and distinctly Floridian images. The bird, animal, and floral depictions were created by sculptor Lee Lawry, best known for his Atlas statue at Rockefeller Center in New York. Metalworker Samuel Yellen crafted the large brass doors on the north side of the tower that depict the story of creation, as well as the wrought iron gates leading to the doors. On the south side of the tower, Yellen contributed to the sundial that features a bronze snake amid the signs of the zodiac and Roman numerals that display the time of day. Yellen's work can be seen on college campuses including Yale, Harvard, and Princeton, and on numerous churches including the Washington National Cathedral. Tile maker J. H. Dulles created the elaborate floor of the tower and added color to the top third of the structure. Bach's instruction to Maderi and the craftsmen uh, were to make the tower beautiful and to have it reflect nature, and that's exactly what they were able to do. Walking through the gardens, a visitor might hear the tower before they see it. The Singing Tower houses one of only 600 carillons in the world. It has 60 bronze bells, the largest of which weighs about 12 tons. A keyboard instrument at the top of the tower is attached to clappers which strike the bells, creating music. There are beautiful bells all over the world, but there is always something else going wrong. Like uh, the, the, the carillon I played before Antwerp Cathedral was um, in the middle of the city and everybody, you know, it's, it's the first thing you hear when you stop playing music is noise because it's in the middle of a city. So it's not nice for a musician. It's difficult for our listeners to find a quiet spot, etc. You know, and there is, um, so this here, this tower in this sanctuary is unique in the world. Nowhere else um, you'll find this. Um, the, the gardens are like a natural concert hall. No traffic, beautiful, peace, serene. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's a dream for me to play, to perform. And it's, it's a dream for the listeners because they can hear every single note, no matter how quiet I play. Both classicism and romanticism are reflected in Western culture. Classicists focus on balance, order, and rational design, while romantics are preoccupied with emotion and Eastern influences and the unpredictability of nature. While Vizcaya and Bach Tower Gardens reflect classical ideals, the Murakami Japanese Gardens and the Atlantic Center for the Arts have more romantic sensibilities. Tucked away on 67 acres of pine and palmetto forest just outside of New Smyrna is the Atlantic Center for the Arts. Since opening its doors in 1982, the center has brought together diverse groups of composers, writers, playwrights, choreographers, and visual artists to work among the trees overlooking the tidal estuary Turnbull Bay. Atlantic Center for the Arts was founded in 1977 by Doris Leeper, who was an artist, environmentalist, visionary who had the idea of a place where people, artists working in different disciplines, could come together and live and work in a natural environment. In 1961, Doris Leeper moved to Eldora, Florida on the Indian River Lagoon. She became very active in Florida's environmental movement, fighting to preserve our natural resources. Liepert's efforts helped lead to Congress declaring the 58,000-acre Canaveral National Seashore an environmentally protected area in 1975. As an artist, Leeper is best known for her large-scale, site-specific modern sculpture. Her work has gained international recognition, with more than 100 of her pieces displayed by museums, corporations, and private collectors. Doris Leeper's great success as an artist was sometimes overshadowed by the role she played in the creation of the Canaveral National Seashore and her establishment of the Atlantic Center for the Arts. 
Dora Sleeper was a force to be reckoned with. Uh, she was raised in Piedmont, North Carolina, and attended college at Duke University, where she originally intended to be a pre-med major, hence her nickname, Doc. Um, she went on to major in art, and really a woman of her time in the 50s became uh, an, an amazing artist at a time when you know women weren't so prevalent in the field. She attended other artist communities where typically Typically, if you were a writer, you were working at a writing residency. If you were a painter, you were working at a painting residency. And she had the idea for people from di different disciplines to come together to live and work and share ideas. And that's really how the idea for ACA blossomed. When Doris Leeper founded the Atlantic Center for the Arts, she made sure that the buildings would not disrupt the natural setting of the site. She approved a design that blended in with the natural environment. The wooden studios, galleries, workspace, performance areas, and artist residences are connected with boardwalks winding through the forest. The design of the buildings, the layout of our campus here, uh, was centered around the environment. She worked early with the architect Will Miller, who um, moved buildings from the original site plan, who said, this tree needs to be saved, we need to move a walkway. Um, it was very much part of her aesthetic. Uh, our campuses attached by raised wooden boardwalks. Um, the environment um, is naturally protected here. There are no cutbacks to any of our studios. So she worked very closely um, with the city of New Smyrna Beach um, in ensuring that, you know, this natural scrub oak um, was able to stay an important part of the facility here. Well, I can tell you one thing, our insurance company is not happy. They would prefer that all the buildings not be plopped into nature, if you will. Um, but, you know, the stories about Dora Sleeper are that as each, as the buildings were being constructed, each tree was handpicked to stay or go by her based on where the buildings would go. And so really trying to tune in the buildings to the environment was a huge part of the project. And you'll notice that all the buildings are built about 30 inches off the ground and raised up so that all the wildlife can still continue to move around the property unencumbered by man's interference with nature. But I think really with the combination of the architecture, the combination of the site, um, it was really a fabulous job of kind of combining these buildings with nature so that really everything is seamless. And you can be 30 feet away from another building and potentially not know it due to the cover and the natural environment that's still here. The Master Artist in Residence program at the Atlantic Center for the Arts brings in groups of accomplished artists to mentor and work with selected mid-career artists in their field. The multi-week residency program often results in fascinating collaborations. For example, poets may write verses to accompany an original musical composition the dancers perform to. The Atlantic Center for the Arts has hosted a distinguished list of master artists who have worked and collaborated there. They include playwright Edward Albee, composer John Corigliano, United States poet laureate Howard Nemirov, and poet Sonia Sanchez, just to name a few. You know, when Doris envisioned this property, she envisioned a lot of buildings connecting through these boardwalk systems, but also the artists um, having to walk through nature in order to get where they're going. And so in this really peaceful, serene setting, you have these pathways that lead you around the corner into another vista that uncovers a new building where another artist might be working. And when the architects created that complex, I think they were really thinking about the nature the natural forward environment. You notice that a lot of the buildings are in the cracker style in a way with these metal roofs and wooden construction and so um, I think it's all part of the big plan that she had and uh, obviously she was very tuned into the buildings um, originally built in the 80s and was also heavily involved in the Leaper Studio Complex construction uh, in the mid-90s. Doris Leaper died in 2000, one year after being inducted into the Florida Artists Hall of Fame. Leeper's creative vision and passion for protecting Florida's natural environment live on today in her art, the Canaveral National Seashore, and the Atlantic Center for the Arts. Nestled within the hustle and bustle of urban South Florida is a serene and contemplative place that evokes rural Japan. The Murakami Museum and Japanese Gardens in Delray Beach was a gift to Floridians from successful farmer George Murakami, who immigrated here in 1906 as a member of the Yamato community. 
Joe Sakai, a recent graduate of the business school at New York University, came to Florida in 1903 with plans to create a series of Japanese agricultural communities. State leaders were excited by Sakai's proposal and took him to potential development sites. Henry Flagler's model land company was encouraging settlement along the rapidly expanding Florida East Coast Railway. The railway could provide shipping for produce. A piece of land in present day Boca Raton with access to the railway seemed like a good spot for Sakai to begin a farming community. In November of 1903, he sailed from New York to、uh, Jacksonville and、uh, met with、uh, Captain Garner of the Jacksonville Board of Trade. And、uh, others in the state of Florida, including the governor of the state. And,、um, uh, he, and he presented to them, each of them, a, uh, uh, a, a plan for establishing one or more Japanese agricultural colonies here in the state of Florida. And this was something that、uh, Florida business and political leaders were quite excited to hear about. And they,、uh, they, they certainly welcomed him、uh, to the state and whisked him on a whirlwind tour of the state to view various sites where the first of these proposed colonies could be established. Sakai selected a piece of land near present day Boca Raton to begin his agricultural endeavors. He called the community Yamato, an ancient name for Japan. George Murakami was 19 years old when he emigrated to the Yamato community from Miyatsu, Japan in 1906. He was originally an indentured laborer working to pay off his passage to America. Like the other Yamato colonists, Murakami grew and sold fruits and vegetables, including tomatoes and pineapples. The colony was successful for about 20 years. By the late 1920s, a failing economy was taking its toll, and most of the Yamato colonists relocated to other parts of the country or went back to Japan. Eventually, George Murakami was the last remaining farmer from the Yamato community. During World War II, the U.S. government seized Murakami's land to create an Army Air Corps training base where the Boca Raton Airport and Florida Atlantic University are now located. Near the end of the war, Murakami relocated his farm to Delray Beach, where he continued working for nearly 30 years. In the early 1970s, Murakami began what was a surprisingly difficult effort to give his land away. With the growth occurring in South Florida since that time, reluctance to accept a gift of prime real estate is almost unimaginable today. Palm Beach County eventually did accept Murakami's generous donation of nearly 200 acres. What was once rural farmland is now surrounded by urban growth and housing developments. He was able to acquire this property、uh, in the closing days of World War II. And、uh, some 20 years later, now an elderly man, Mr. Morikami,、uh, began to think of his own future. And he wanted to, uh, he wanted to uh, give his property away to an organization like the city of Delray Beach or Palm Beach County. Uh, to be used in a manner to benefit the people of his adopted country, the United States. He、uh, felt he was uh, afforded uh, many opportunities here and he wanted to thank the people of his adopted country for these opportunities. Murakami was granted United States citizenship in 1967. The Murakami Museum and Japanese Gardens opened in 1977, two years after George Murakami's death at the age of 89. Winding paths on the property take visitors through six Japanese gardens representing various historical periods. The museum features rotating exhibits of both traditional and contemporary Japanese art and artifacts. A critically acclaimed restaurant serves Pan Asian cuisine. While experiencing the serenity of the Murakami Museum and Japanese gardens, visitors can reflect upon the amazing cultural contributions made by diverse immigrants seeking the American dream in Florida. As urban sprawl envelops much of our state's landscape, it's essential that we have places that preserve and protect Florida's nature and culture. You've been watching Florida Frontiers, presented by the Florida Historical Society. I'm Ben Broatmarkle.
The Florida Historical Society presents Florida Frontiers is made possible in part by the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund and by Florida Space Coast Office of Tourism, representing destinations from Titusville to Cocoa Beach to Melbourne Beach. The Space Coast has a diverse 72 miles of beach, including surf towns and sea turtle nests. We have inspiring attractions, including the Kennedy Space Center, Brevard Museum of History and Natural Science, and the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. More information is available at www.visitspacecoast.com. The Florida Historical Society Press publishes books on a variety of topics relating to our state's diverse history and culture. FHS Press titles include Life and Death at Windover, Excavations of a 7,000-Year-Old Pond Cemetery, The Voyages of Ponce de Leon, Scholarly Perspectives, Hollow Victory, a novel of the Second Seminole War, Stetson Kennedy's Palmetto Country, and Walkin' Lawton. More information at fhspress.org.